Hey everybody, Andy here. Happy Thursday, helping you build a career you love. Today we are gonna be talking job searching and making it faster and easier. If you're here with me live, get in the chat, say hi. Let me know who you are, where you're from, what you do, what you need. Put some question marks in front of your questions. Tony P, EGR, Music 80s, Buffer, Truckerman, Suzanne, Patty, Vanessa, Daryl D, great to see you and everybody else. What are we talking about today? Job searching is hard, it sucks. And I'm noticing that a lot of people wanna make it a lot harder than it is. So I thought about if I had to job search and I had to do it all over again, knowing what I know, seeing what I've seen, what would I tell them to do? How would I take it down? How would I simplify it? And I was, um, I was thinking about this a couple of weeks back as I was working on a project for myself and I had placed some constraints on myself and I came up with something that I thought was really good and I only came up with it because of the limitations that I imposed on myself. And I thought, I need to, I need to bring this to a lesson to my, to my job searching community to teach them how to put restrictions on their job search to make it better, make them faster, make them more powerful, and get the results that they want. And I wanna, I wanna take you through seven specifics and a bonus, so eight uh, of the things that I would take a very close look at. If you're just starting your job search, this is where I'd start. If you are in the middle of your job search and it ain't working, I would strip it down to these seven or eight things, depending on who you are. Now, I wanna start out with a couple stories. One's a pretty short one, and one is a little bit longer. It's a little bit of a peek into my life, but, but uh, I, I think it's an interesting story to share with you, something I'd like you to know about me, but something that I'd like you to think about for yourself. Now, I don't know if you know who Susan Kerr is, and you, you may never have heard of her, uh, but if you, if you have one of, of these Apple devices, uh, you know, she is, is a very big part of your life because when, when they were creating the first Macintosh, uh, they enlisted her. She's a, a, a design, like an artist, like, like an artist artist. And um, they, they said to her, you got, you got a 1024 square space, like a 32 by 32 grid. We need you to draw us the fonts, the folders, the brushes, the little icons or whatever we're going to use. And you got to do it in that space. And she didn't whine about it. She didn't complain about it. And with a piece of graph paper and a pencil, she basically drew a lot of, of the foundation of what we use today in a Mac. And it's obviously evolved and it's much prettier and the resolutions are higher and everything looks a little fancier. But it was a pretty spectacular uh, creation and primarily because she had constraints and she didn't complain about it. Now, there was something at my life a number of years ago that I, I wanted to complain about, but I didn't. And I want, I want to share this story with you. It's maybe a, a, it's a few minutes, but I, 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 I hope that you can apply this to your life, and I definitely want you to apply this to your job search. So when I got out of school, I spent my first 10 years as an IT and management consultant with, with, uh, with Anderson Consulting. It's now Accenture. And I run large projects. I built project man management methodology, estimating tools, other, other governance things to run very large projects. And in the beginning of 1999, there was a dot-com boom. Uh, maybe you were there, maybe you remember it, or maybe you remember the, the cratering of it. Either which way, I was um, recruited out of where I was, and I took a job with a company called Inforte in the beginning of 1999. That's actually where Kara and I met way, way back, back in the day. And I started there in January and I was, you know, there was 107 people. I was employee number 108 and they were hiring me to actually build out a sales and account development methodology, teach them how to sell into large accounts, how to, how, once you sell them, how to grow them, how to work with the customers, how to run projects and things of that nature. So I got there, I was there for about a week and I started getting my assignments and my clients and I started going out into the, into the world and I realized that we weren't running projects very well. And while initially it could have looked like a disaster, I realized this is why they hired me, was to help clean it up. And while you're running a quarter of a million dollar project, when you have a 20% overrun, it's not the end of the world, but, but we're staring down the barrel of seven figure jobs. And when you start running 20, 30% over, it kind of stings. So we implemented custom solutions and we, we implemented a lot of customer relationship management solutions, uh, Salesforce automation, customer experience, things of that nature using the Siebel product, which is, is, is now part of Oracle, I, I believe, unless they've been gobbled up by somebody else. But anyway, 
uh, I created an estimating tool that would help um, the people who are running the projects plan the project, estimate the project, know how long it should take, put some controls in place and things of that nature. I brought everybody who was responsible for doing these kind of things in on the weekends um, around April and I, I, I was teaching this stuff and everything was going well. And But a few months later, we started to pick up these other technologies, like four or five, four or five more uh, of whatever the hot new things were that large companies, the Fortune 500 blue chips, but the startups, the dot-coms, were trying to implement these solutions with Blue Martini and Vignette and Ariba and some of these other newer products at the time. So uh, one day, a few months later, my boss, who was the chief operating officer and the, and the VP of sales, came in to see me and they said, Andy, could, could we talk to you for a few minutes? That was fairly normal. We talked quite a bit, but when they, were, when they walked me to the conference room, I knew this was something serious because most of what we could handle, we could do in the hallway. But I sat down, they looked at me, and they said, we're getting invited to a lot of proposals, but we're not able to respond fast enough. Companies are moving at such a breakneck pace that we need to create a response to our proposal and tell them what the project's going to cost, and we need to do that within 24 hours. I said, well, that, that seems kind of silly. Why is that necessary? Wouldn't, isn't it better to kind of get it right? And they said, well, that's not even the worst part. They want us to be able to fix our fee and tell them exactly what it's going to cost to within plus or minus 10%. And I'm thinking a million dollars, and I'm thinking two phases out, and they want something down to to 10% accuracy with less than 24 hours, you know, to to assess it. And the two of them looked at each other, and they said, "Yeah, that about sizes it up." And I looked at them, and I said, "You guys are nuts." And actually, I I, I probably I think I used two words. One started with an F. The second one was crazy, but I got the idea. So I said, "Let me get this straight. We're hiring these people off the street." who don't know anything about these technologies, we're sending them into these discovery sessions with a salesperson and we're asking them, they can't even, they don't know the technology, they can barely even spell it, and you want them to be able to create something within 24 hours. So I said, okay. So I got on the phone, I called a number of technologists that each worked in the different, you know, within these different technologies, and I said, hey, you know, how do you break these units down? What does this look like? You know, if I ask you to make these changes, what does that look like? How long does it take you? What are the variations? So I start to get a basis for estimating these these new tools. Now, I was flying to three different cities at the time. I was in California, Minnesota, and North Carolina every week. And so I had maybe at least the 14, 15 hours in the air. So I built a tool over the next couple of weeks for each one of the different solutions of which we had eight. And I said, okay, I've got to send somebody into a meeting who doesn't know anything about the technology. So how can I do this? So I created a sheet, one sheet, an Excel spreadsheet for each of the different technologies. And I said, I taught everybody, all the delivery executives, we call them. I said, you go into a session. All you need to do is you need to ask these questions. All you need to tell the tool is yes or no, give it a number, one to whatever, and then gauge high, medium, low on each of these questions if, if they're appropriate. And if they're not applicable, just put NA or whatever. And then I'm thinking, there's nothing magical about 24 hours. I could get that number in 2.4 seconds. I could just have him do what I teach him to do. And I could have taken a 22-year-old who had absolutely no experience in anything, shot him into a meeting with a sales rep, and asked these questions from a customer and come up with the same number. And so when I showed this tool to my boss, I mean, I literally saw a tear in his eye. He, I mean, he finally understood that we were going to be able to do this. So I, I got with the people who were responsible for running these projects and I said, okay, look, I need you to, all the new projects, I need you to run it with this tool. I need you to plan it this way. The other thing is I need you to go to all your existing projects and I need you to pr pretend like you're starting over and make a run at this as if you didn't know anything. And it's fine to massage it, but we need, we, I need data and we need to fine tune this thing and I need to meet with you within like the next three months and we need to watch what's happening so I can tune this thing so we don't take a bath. So that's what we did. And while this was going on, now the motor's really running. And now I think, well, heck, what else can I do for them? I could give them a button that after they come up with that plan, they can hit a button and it would put all the staffing resources out. You know, who needed what, how many project managers, business analysts, technologists, and whatever, when they needed to start, all the dependencies. I could build macros for that. What else can I do with it? I could shoot that data into the, into the operational staffing system. The ops guy is going to love me because he's not going to have to chase anybody down. And all of this stuff started to occur because I had to do something that would never have occurred to me, ever. Why would this be necessary? 
I just had 10 years of tried and true practices that say it makes sense to take your time and estimate it right and get it right. You know, you're, you're, you're measuring it with a micrometer, marking it with chalk and cutting it with an ant. Why would I, why would I rush that? So this thing to me, so why am I telling you this? Because I, there were constraints that were placed on me that forced me to do what? They forced me to get creative. They forced me to focus, like really focus. They forced me to channel all my energy into thinking about how this can be done inside the parameters I was given. And when you think about it, I would say to you that the greatest inventions, you know, I know you know that expression, right? Necessity is the mother of all inventions. But your creativity when you're thinking in these constraints is going to bring you a lot more creativity. And I would say to you that expression about you know, hey, think outside the box, I actually think that's a pretty stupid expression because I want you to think in the box. I want you to make the box as small as possible because that's gonna bring out the best in you. When you start to figure out what are the constraints that really matter, speed mattered, accuracy mattered. So how can we build something and make it bulletproof that would do that? And for more than a decade, even well after I left, that company used that tool to estimate all its projects that it did that way. It was probably the most impactful tool I ever created that had the biggest impact per capita, per dollar, per whatever on an organization. So why am I telling you this? Because I had to strip it down to the necessities. I need you to strip down your job search, strip it down to the studs. And so today I want to talk to you about what those studs are because I think the more constraints you put on yourself, the less you do, the better it will be. And don't get me wrong, less is only more if what you're doing less of, you're doing better. Okay, so, so I'm not saying don't send more messages. I'm saying only send messages to a particular type of person. Shrink your base. Okay, so I want to, I want to go through that and I think about, you know, some of the best social media messages I ever wrote were because I had to pack it in a tweet. All right, this is you packing your job search into a tweet and I got a bunch of them here. So I got a question though. I got to ask you guys before I get into the, into, the, into the numbers. What's the roughest part of your job search? Tell me what the roughest part of your job search is. I'd like to see this. I'd actually like to take a sip of this beautiful tea Jump, go in the chat, just just distill it down. Give me a couple of words, right? Resume, interview, like just what's the toughest part? I wanna, I wanna see this. And let me see if I can, um, I, I know we're on, a, we're on a bit of a delay here. <clears throat> and 45 second to one minute max answer. Another awesome story. <laughs> I appreciate that. Give me it. Toughest part of the job search. I'd love to see what this is. And hi from France, yes, Egadio, great, here, motivation. Tell me, tell me what you got. Let me see if I can pull this up without, I would never tried this. Here we go, what do we got? Motivation, finding the people. Deb let me show, identifying the target companies, Geraldine, HR, Michael Tierney, that's a fresh template menu interview that never takes me further. Preparing for the interview, resume and cover letter, going beyond HR. Look at you guys, I love it. Not finding the positions. John C.E., what's up, buddy? Jessica Lewis, I love it. Suzanne, Liz, finding the time to apply. Later rounds of interviews, find companies that fit my parameters. Okay, I want you guys to keep this stuff in mind. I'm going on my cards here. And uh, all right, here's what I would do. Stripping it down to the studs, baby, okay? Focus, focus, focus. <laughs> Can you do a one second test? All right, this is not remedial. This is not remedial, what do I mean? Can you tell me in one second what you do? I'm a career coach. I coach people, right? I help them find jobs, those kinds of things, right? Now, why is this so important? Well. If you could see what I see and the number of people that I coach and I get their resumes in advance and I, right, I get all their stuff and I read through them. These are brilliant people, bright people, ambitious people who are willing to spend money to take their time with me to go through their, their, their work life. 
And I would say more than half the time, I don't know what they do. Like I li meaning not that I'm unaware of what an architect does or what an engineer does or whatever. It's like that they are an engineer, that they are a strategist of some kind. And if, if, and, and it takes me 15 to 30 minutes sometimes asking them questions to distill it down to one second. And I'm your coach who loves you. And I'm willing to spend however long it takes to get it right for you. But you're going into an interview and it's taking you longer to explain what you are because you haven't distilled it down. And those people are not as in love with you as I am because you're interrupting their day because they got deadlines and customers and bosses yelling at them and everything else that's going on in their life. They don't want to spend all that time to try to figure out what you are. They need to know what you are. It would be better if they knew in advance before you even got there. That's the resume part. But on the resume, can I see it in one second? Boot campers, tomorrow, hot seat in you with resume, with your resumes. We're going to pull them up, okay? Hopefully, you'll get the memo today about that if you didn't already. But can you do this? Why is this so important? It crystallizes what your bread and butter is and why they need you. All right, now let's take it up one notch, one sentence test. Now, you might have seen my describe yourself in one sentence, the elevator pitch, the headline kind of thing. But this is really important that you tighten that up because when I introduce myself, I say, I help people find jobs and thrive in their career. That's what I do. Now, there's a lot of different ways I do that, but that's really what I do. That's what you pay me for, or that's what you come to the show for, right? So that's it. But this week, I've talked to six or seven people. Every single one of them has got awesome backgrounds that do a lot of different things. But if you can't distill this, I don't care how many different things. Do you have any idea how many different things I do, right? I write books, I write blogs, I have a YouTube channel, I have a podcast, I have this, I have that. I do different things. Sometimes I have online training courses, sometimes I give free webinars, sometimes I write a blog post, sometimes I coach you, sometimes you pay for a session with me, sometimes, right, like, all, it doesn't matter. I do all these different things to make that happen. But ultimately, that's what I do. Now, a lot of you, especially the senior folks who are multifaceted, which is awesome, by the way, but from a communication standpoint, you need to be, can you strip it down? Two, that's my bread and butter. That's my bread and butter. And sometimes it's complicated, and if you gotta take a minute to tell me, that's too long. That's 50 seconds too long. So, and it's, it's long for you, and this is great practice for you, not only introducing yourself, but this is the best clarity marker you'll ever have. I ultimately do this. I help companies generate more money through digital marketing assets. Right, that's whatever it is, but it needs to be clear. Now I could say, I help white collar professionals find six figure jobs and thrive in them. That's another way I could add more teeth, so to speak. But can you do this, stripping it down to the stud? Number one, who has a hard time with this? Who has a hard time with this one? Show me in the chat. All right, next one. Okay, this is a, this is a big one, this is a big one. What will I do? Now, what will I do? I know some of you are laughing, right? Okay. Show of hands, how many of you are searching in several different industries? How many are, of you are searching for multiple functional roles? So here's, this would better serve you, and I wanna be really clear, because I don't want you to get confused between some of the messages that I teach you. If you're open to five industries, pick one. Pick the one you love the most. Channel everything into that. Channeling works. If you are a PM, but you could do project management office, PM work, and BA work, pick one. Pick the best. Pick the one you want and go with that. Now you might say, well, Andy, haven't you told me that to increase my possibilities, I ought to go up and down my chain? Yes, but that assumes that you have focused and exhausted all avenues and are simply unable to find something. But when you harness it in on one thing, you're going to be much, much more effective. I'll give you an example page from, from my life. You guys know I teach on, well, hopefully you know, I teach on two things. Job searching, which we're talking about today, 
and leadership development, but career development, high performance, self-help, that, that kind of ilk of, of packaging. We talked about that last week with skill development. If I didn't teach on job searching, I'm convinced that if all I did was eat, sleep, breathe, walk, talk, whatever, leadership stuff, and my leadership subscription was the only subscription and the only thing that I offered this world, I could add the number of people in that, in that membership and add two zeros on the, on the back of it. And that's how many more people I could get in there. I'm convinced of that. But when I look at, when I take me down to the box, when I get in the box and I think about what is the thing that I do, I think from who I want to serve and the fact that I think about you, I want me to be for you the only place you ever need to go to get anything career related. Aside from I need to learn how to code in whatever language, I'm talking about anything that has to do with your skill development, finding the right job, thriving in it, developing your skills that transcend all functions and so on. I want to be the only place you go. So my focal point is the individual. And I use different assets to focus on serving the individual. What don't I do? I don't, I don't work with companies. I don't teach companies when they say, will you come and show us how to help, help my team how to interview better, how to recruit? Can you, we pay you to do that? No, why don't I want to do that? Because I decided there was, a, there was a line that I drew in the sand that said, I it matters to me more that I help that one person transform their life 100%, going from no job to job or going from this to promotion or whatever, or thriving, because that person chose me individually. If your boss came to you and said, this Andy guy is going to come and teach you interviewing, you need to show up at 2 o'clock. What's that? That person's not going to be vested. I'm not dealing with people who are not vested. And I'm certainly not going to go train a company and half those people are going to be gone by the time I leave the office, right, with the, with the turnover. So I choose not to do that even though that's easier money. It, but my soul matters and what matters to me. I want you to focus on the thing that matters the most to you. And by extension, let's go one more. I would, and I want to be really clear about this. I coach a lot of people that are looking in seven different cities. It's hurting you. Where will I do it? If you're open to move into the South, pick the place you're going to go and do nothing but meditate on that place. I would go, I, if I actually could afford to, if it was me, I would consider it an investment. If I lived in Chicago and I was going to move to Atlanta or wherever, Arizona, my, my, my wife is all over me about that. Right, I would go to the place I was going to move. I would lock myself in a hotel room for a week and I would do nothing but think about all the places and I'd walk around in the neighborhoods and I would just think about this place and send my energy out there. Right, I know that's a little bit of an expense, but I'm telling you, I mean, we had a, we had a, a person in my boot camp, Victor, who did that. I coached him. He was in rural Pennsylvania. I said, go to Washington, D.C., sleep on somebody's couch. He did for a month. He got a, he's changed careers got a different role and a 25% pay increase because he invested in himself that way. All right, so I would, I would siphon it down. You say, well, Andy, hang on a second. You told me I should look all over the US. Yeah, that's fine to do. If what? If you focus down on this. I'm only going to be a PM at healthcare companies. Awesome, go and find every, per, every healthcare company. I don't care where they are. And then you're targeting from here. This is, this is what you're doing less of. The geographical region, you're open to the possibilities, but that's just because you're trying to get dialogue going with people. But I'm talking about if you actually are genuinely going to move, then you want to try to, as much as possible, limit this. Okay? All right, let's get into number five. Hang on, my cards are flailing all over the place here. All right, number five. How will I find it? I wouldn't do anything, literally nothing. I literally would do nothing zero other than target bosses. Andy, I can't find enough bosses. No, go look at other companies then, right? There are so many people that are out there that would hire you, but a lot of you are farting around with the ATS, chasing recruiters and God forbid third party recruiters and other people who aren't getting back to you and HR people and whatever, I wouldn't do anything. Let me tell you about Rachel. Rachel 
who I love, by the way. Rachel, if you are out there, you know, you know I am your biggest fan. And Rachel, uh, she found herself in Germany because she wanted to marry the love of her life, and she's from South Korea, so she moved, moved to Germany and was there for a, a very short time, found me, joined my coaching program a few years ago, didn't speak the language that really handicapped her ability to get work there, but through the boot camp, within eight weeks, through my boot camp, she got a job with an insurance company. They created a position for her international ins insurance company. Fast forward two years. Now she knows the language a bit better. She is a financial services whiz with mergers and acquisitions. Big time job. But it was very difficult because she wasn't having any luck getting any, you know, any interactions with those types of firms a couple of years ago. So, so and in November Thanksgiving-ish or so, she lets me know, Andy, I want to light it up again. I'm going to go at it. I'd like a session. I said to her, okay, we get together. I said, all right, you're going after the big, the big boys and girls. So she was chasing companies like Bank of America, Deutsche Bank, and some of the others of that ilk. And she had some traction, and then Christmas time rolled around, and New Year's, and things started to slow down. And, and I said, nope, you're only allowed to target bosses, and you're only allowed to do informational interviews or in actual interviews with bosses or people to get you to bosses that you want to work for. That's it. That's your whole scope. You do nothing else. Do nothing. Zero. Nothing else. And that's what she did. And then all of a sudden, it started to die down. And the holidays were here, and I, she said, Andy, what am I doing wrong? I said, nothing. Keep going. She says, yeah, but I said, nope, everything's fine. She says, well, I, got, I had a coffee with this person, and they're not getting back to me. What should I do differently? Nothing. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. And then yesterday, I woke up to this, right? And, and she, oop, here we go. Andy, hi, I got a verbal offer from Credit Suisse. Nailed the interview with the CEO after the one. We had a session recently. I still have informational interviews. I think she's going to get another offer. And she did nothing but what we call in the sales world targeted account selling. That's when they give their best salespeople a finite number of accounts and say you only get to sell to these people. And that's all she did. It was down to nothing. We stripped it down to the studs. I told her do nothing but this. Nothing but this. And this is what happens because she was laser focused. And here's, and here's the thing that I want you to take away from this. She would go into the system and let me know or through our one-on-ones let me know that she felt like she was really struggling and she was beaten up. And I kept telling her, you're doing everything right. You're doing everything right. It only takes one. Right? That's a pawn being moved off the chessboard. But what do most people do? Well, they didn't get back to me, so that, that Andy's technique doesn't work. There's a million things that, that contribute. Not to mention, so the more people she targeted at those particular types of companies that increased the number of, di of dialogues and discussions she had in coffee meetings and video meetings and whatever, that's pretty dang fast. Right? This is like eight weeks into the new year. And this is what's happening. So I'm telling you, the, I'm not saying do less. I'm saying hit more bosses if you're going to do anything. Stripping it down to the stud, right? That's what I'm talking about. All right, how about this one? This is the trickiest one, though. Here's the trickiest one. What about the interviewing, right? We saw a bunch of those in the... In the all right, it's about them. 99% of the people I coach. Here again, love these people, brilliant, bright superstars. Do interviewing prep backwards. And I'm gonna be really specific. So, like this or not, you in an interview are in a sales call. I don't care if you don't like sales, it, it is what it is. And the best sales people, the best sales people can show the individual that they're speaking to and it's an individual, it's not a company, it's an individual. You're talking to a person, right? You sell to people. How their life's going to be transformed. How, maybe how their company's going to be, how they are going to benefit and how, what this means to them. They think about that person and how that person's life's going to be solved. Do you know what they're not thinking? I'm a desperate job seeker and I need this job. 
every single time as an information technology and management consultant, I went into a sales call. Every single time as an executive recruiter selling recruitment services or as, an, as me, the recruiter, going in to sell the recruitment services, not one time did I think, uh-oh, I need this job. Uh-oh, I need their money. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. I, 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 I'm a company, I'm selling my services. What happens if I don't get this? I'm thinking, you have a problem and I'm the answer, okay? You have a problem and I'm the solution. You all are the solution to somebody's problem. You need to think of it that way. You should not be thinking, oh, oh, I need this job. Oh, what are they gonna ask me? No, the stripping it down to the stunts part is obsessing over that person you're gonna be talking to and trying to build a relationship with them, thinking about what it is they need to know to know how their life and their company or whoever they represent or speak on behalf of is going to change. And that's what you need to be obsessed about. And I did a, I did a, a job search challenge that many of you know, and that job search challenge will help you with the part I talked about with Rachel, where you're targeting bosses. That's job search challenge, Andy, part one. I also did a job search challenge, part two, the meta level stuff, the advanced tactics, and I talk about how to do this, how to obsess over the interviewer, how to think forward that this is the first step in building the long-term relationship that you are gonna have with them. And when you think about that, here's the difference in mindsets. Andy, I gotta learn all the behavioral questions and the stories I'm gonna tell and the this and that. That's you being the desperate job seeker and thinking about you and what you wanna say. Here's what I mean. You're gonna go to a you're gonna go to an interview four different people throughout the day. They all get four different stories about the tell me about yourself question. Right? What does that HR person need to know? What does the hiring official need to know? What does the tech screener need to know? What does the staff member I'm uh, talking to, who as a courtesy, needs to know about me? Do you think any of them would get the same tell me about yourself story? No, because you have to obsess over them and tailor what you're saying to what they need to understand so that you're connecting with them so that you're building the relationship with them. Not, here's what I am, here's what I do, here's a story about a disagreement, here's a whatever. It's gotta be about them, not about you. But you all study this about you from your history standpoint, okay? When I think about prepping a job search packet for you, I'm thinking about you. What are they struggling with? What do they need to know? Right? There's so many things that I know that you never hear about because I have to choose what you need to know so that it changes your results, not how it would necessarily change my results. That's what you got to obsess over. It's about them. Work backwards. Work backwards. What would the staff person care about? Right? Do you think that person cares so much about that great unit you built over there or as it relates to how the unit you build affects me and my development and what opportunities I might get and what your work management style is like and how I might want to work with it and how I'm going to benefit from that? You need to think about them. And now some of you are saying, well, Andy, I don't always know the person I'm going to go talk to or I don't know their background. They have no digital footprint. I can't look them up. What's their title? Extrapolate, guess. They pop somebody in front of you, be a little nimble on your feet. Ask them, who are you? What do you do? What's important? Just let me know. I just want some context, right? Meta stuff, meta stuff, down to the stud. This is where you start, okay? All right, wait, hang on, hang on. Got salary. I had to throw this one in. All right, number seven. You just need to be thinking, Andy says, find a needle and a thread and sew my lips together. Do not break the glass until I got an offer in front of my face. Let me tell you about M. I'm going to call her M because she's got a, a, a pretty unique first name and she's in my coaching program and she was flailing around in her search and I'm going to tell you what button in your lips does for your, for your salary. Negotiation had an eclectic background, a lot of non-household names, startups that failed, short-term companies, even I think she was a day trader for a while, wanted to get a job at a fang company. So she got in my boot camp, in the big boot camp, and got organized, got directed, and then got 
an, was getting down to the end, was about get, getting an offer. She wanted to have a coaching session with me. She said, Annie, um, I, I'm out of work. I've been out of work for a while. Out of work, early 50s, single mom, no, no income. And one of the big boys and girls was about to hire her. She said, I did what you told me. I never told them anything. I kept pushing it off. I said, make me a fair offer. They came to me with what the broad strokes. And she, did, she was so blown away by the number. She said, can I get more? Yeah, let's get together. All right, here's what you do. Here's what we know. Here's what you say. And there were some things that we knew and some things that we didn't. So I gave her literally the exact words to say. On this part, you have a base salary, restricted stock units. You have some vacation days, some of these other sign-on bonus, some of these other miscellaneous things. For the things that are discrete, we're going to ask for $55,000 more in the first year at a minimum. That's the cash part. And we don't know. We need to ask it in a manner so that you allow them to take control and own the decision. But, you, but because there are uncertainties in some of this, we need to do some things. We need to jab them a couple times. We need to bruise them a little bit to let them know that there is uncertainty in your decision and where the certainty lies, where that line is that you will give them your word, you'll take it. So I want you to do some very specific things to get them thinking, and then I want you to do some vague things to make sure that you give them an opportunity to decide how badly they want you, because based on what they do with the vague stuff, we're gonna know how they feel about you and how much harder we can push, right? So sometimes you can't do all this in one fell swoop. She was so nervous about this because she'd already gotten like a, like a 50K sign-on bonus. She's like, I never got a sign-on bonus, but I didn't understand. I said, no, we need, to, we need to increase that. We need to increase this, and we need to ask for more stock, and you, you let them know that it's up to their discretion, and then you give them all this roll together, and then you tell them if they meet this, you will make everything else go away. You will drop your other interviews. You will give them your start date and so on because they need to be certain that they know if they hit these numbers that you're theirs. And they will likely exceed your request, which she found odd. I said, because they don't want the uncertainty. Okay, so here's what I woke up to right after Rachel's, right after Rachel's uh, message. I woke up to this one. And this is what, because she did not say anything, did not tell them what she earned, did not tell them what she expected, and she said, they blew me away by coming. They basically upped her call 50% on top of what she countered with because they wanted to make it go away because they had no frame of reference. She made the argument. There were other things that she needed to do. Now, this is a tall offer, but we made it a lot taller Okay, so I mean, you know, when you're going from three and a quarter to four and a quarter with one counter, that's pretty good. You can't do that when you're talking about salary along the way. Things like this don't happen. So this is what happens when you when you button when you button up. So I want you to I want you to think about that. I know some of you think, well, Andy, I'm wasting my time. You're not wasting your time. You have to get through it, convince them you're worth it. And then when you get down to the end, there are a lot of tactics that you can take advantage of that you have at your disposal because you did not talk about this along the way. And they don't have a frame of reference. And you need to get where their head is first, which is what she did. And so that was, I was so happy for her. All right, those are seven. Now I got one more. Actually, I, I think I might have saved my, my favorite one for career changers for last. All right, now, if you are changing careers, you know, you guys say, well, how much time should I spend on this and that? I say to you, if you are a career changer, 100% of your time should be spent networking. Okay, so networking only for career changers. Don't try to boss hunt. Okay, don't try to boss hunt unless you're getting introduced by somebody who's really close to the boss. And don't go in the, heaven forbid, don't go in the applicant tracking system. So what happens when you get focused? This I woke up to on Sunday. This is from Maria. Same kind of thing. Andy, great news. This is a job changer for a, a woman in her 50s who wanted to change careers I, I accept, joins the program, desired company, within three months, I recognize I wasted a lot of time, I was feeling directionless, 
I found the program, but this, this is the thing that I really love because you could have an experience or you can gain an experience. The program isn't about jobs. Don't think my program is about job searching. It's about focus, proactivity, confidence, like she said. These are experiences that will transcend. And what? I networked my way. I networked my way, right? She stopped doing the other stuff, bypassed the ATS, even negotiated a raise, didn't have to sacrifice her happiness criteria. And the other thing, there are people around you in your community, whether in our community that are welcome, that are welcoming and support you, or people that you, you know, that you can uh, tap into. But job searching doesn't need to be lonely, right? The networking part, this networking part, will really help you. And if you don't have a network, you gotta build one. All right. So if Andy had to job search all over again. I would make sure I was crystal clear and somebody knew within a second what I did. I would make sure that I had a one sentence test. I would make sure that I know the industry and function I was going to go for. I would only I would only focus on one. I'd make sure my geo was in order and I would think and target only one place. I would only target bosses. I would do nothing else. I'm not even being funny. I would think about and obsess over the interview. I might pick their pictures out, put them in my booklet and just think about them. Okay, that's what I do. I think about all you. I got your faces somewhere. Button your lips on salary and networking for career changers. All right, that's all I got today, people. If you're loving it, Click the thumbs up button. Make sure to share this. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you're here with me live, we're going to the chat. If not, I'll see you next week. All right. You guys, I hope you like that. I, uh, I loved putting that one to, together for you. Uh, couple quick announcements. Uh, all month productivity challenge is going on every Monday. If you want, check it out. Leadership program. Tomorrow... Uh, and my, my job search coaching, pro, the, one, the program that those three emailers used is on special for $100 off right now. Maybe the team could, team, could, you, could, you, could you dump that in the, in the chat and pin that uh, for me? And uh, if, if, you, uh, if you're interested in joining us, tomorrow we're going to hot seat some people. I got some things I'm going to be teaching you about choosing. I got two extremes tomorrow. If you're in the if you're in the boot camp, the coaching program, that's tomorrow. There's a private session at eleven. We got one group that of people that are like got eight offers and they're trying to pick. So I'm gonna talk to them. And then we got the other people who are getting moving that really could benefit from like the some of the t t topics today about the one set second, the one sentence, the getting congruent. And, and having clarity and being directed and being able to quickly advertise your uh, your, your value, uh, we're gonna hot seat some of you guys tomorrow. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So that that's a hundred bucks off, and um, and grab uh, grab grab that. And if there are any boot campers here that want to share their their story, awesome. Remember the interview intervention book back there is still seven bucks for that hardbound and the ebook, which is $9, and the audiobook, which is unavailable anywhere but with me, and you get the $27 ebook, How to Interview the Employer, 75 Great Questions to Ask Before You Take Any Job. I think I'm just gonna put a seven part job search together and have a class on stripping it down to the studs. Two, one of these, it's gonna be my next one. Uh, let me see, uh, Kara is sending me stuff, and Kara, what, what do we have here? Oh, you're giving me, you're giving me uh, some some questions. Nancy Lee, my boot camper, glad you are doing this today. I've been feeling discouraged as I have been doing the job search challenge for two weeks now. I'm not going to stop, but I feel the struggle. So, can I? I want to say this. So, you know, we're talking about constraints, and I don't, I don't know that you're going to remember this from last week, but I'm never going to forget this. Last week, it was 12.43 p.m. on Friday. We had a special show. At 12.43, I got a question. I only had until 12.45. I had a hard stop. I got a question from Anna, and Anna was talking about feeling discouraged, like Nancy mentions. And about a month, six weeks ago, I was sitting in my chair back there, and I do, I do things to test myself. And one of the things that I was doing to test myself was I had read a couple emails about people being discouraged, and I was saying to myself, how, 
what's the shortest amount of time it could take me and the fewest words I could use to help somebody feel better? Like just give them the punchline and let them go from there. And I don't know if you remember what I said if you were here an hour and 45 minutes into the show, but I told Anna, measure actions first, results second, right? I was talking about, you know, my little closing line is put people first, results second. That's true. But when you are going through life in anything, especially, especially something that you are not highly skilled at, which is job searching, right? None of you should be skilled job searchers. You shouldn't but you beat yourselves up as if you should be great at this instantly, right? Because you're associating your job search success with the quality of your ability to do the job. Those two are unrelated. You got to read. I mean, you need to get that message. You finding a job has nothing to do with how great a worker you are, right? Me getting discovered on YouTube has nothing to do with the quality of my teaching. It has everything to do with how much time I'm gonna spend on search engine optimization. My search engine optimization is your job search, right? So that's how you need, well, I don't know anything about search engine optimization. What do I know? I know throw a video up, teach them and throw a video up, right? So what you need to be measuring is what you can control. Obsess over, did you send the message? Are you sending it to the right person? Are what's happening? Can you manage that? Are, can you make your cover letter better? Can you whatever? Can you track it better? Whatever. Like those kinds of things. Keep going. I'm telling you, Ra like Rachel, I wish, I don't know if Rachel's here. It's, it's, well, it's probably bedtime for her. But I mean, she, you know, she would just email me, Andy, hey, I'm gonna say, I, every single time, I would say, you're doing, you're doing great. You're doing great. You're doing great. She probably thought I was nuts. But just keep going. Keep going. Keep going. All right. John C. Estrada, this is gold. Glad you like it, buddy. EGR NHL. Hey, how to prevent burnout from the preparing for the interview? I have prepared over 100 questions. You don't need to prepare that many questions. You need to think about them. Think about what you need to say to them. Think about what you need to ask them. If you have 100 questions, I have no issue with that. You're not going to get through 100 questions. What are the questions you need to ask that particular person because of who they are and what they would know and what would connect you to them? That's what you do. You're trimming it down. So there's blueprinting. Okay, so I didn't get into this in the talk because I was trying to get this thing in in 40 minutes. All right, here. This one. The interview prep. I would have a list of all the static questions. I don't need to, like, the tell me about yourself. Why do you want to work here? Why'd you leave your company? Um, tell me about a time you disagreed and all that other stuff. That's canned stuff. You do that once, right? Then you obsess over them. Then you go to your arsenal and you pluck. Okay, what's the right story to tell them? I don't need to prep that. It's prepped. It's done. I did it already. I did it once. Right? Do you guys know? Okay. Do you know this talk we just had? Each one of these eight things, the way I learn, the way I teach myself, is programmed now. Okay? I don't have to do this again. And when somebody asks me again four weeks from now about something related to this, the answer's pre-programmed in the Andy head. It lives in a little hotel somewhere, right? It's done. It's done once. Now, what I do when I give you a talk is I continually challenge myself to give you new analogies, different ways of looking at it because I'm trying to strike the chord that's going to register where you're going to have the aha moment and the bell's going to go off, okay? But from a, if you were going to, if somebody, if all you guys sat there and said, we're 150 to, we're drilling Andy, he's getting interviewed. I would sit here and I would just be plucking from all my standard answers and the best of hits, okay? And the anti greatest hits. You go to the EGR, what NHL greatest hits if you need to, and that's your starting point for when you go to an interview for the stuff you know you're gonna get asked, but you have to look at your standard answers in the eyes of the person or the ears of the person who's receiving it. So that has to be changed. That does not take long. It's picking and choosing. 
Music 80s. How would you answer a question to describe a technical weakness related to the position? You have none. Don't, I, would, I, I have none. I, you see my resume. These are my strengths. I'm, I, I feel strong in all of them. Give me a test kind of thing. If they're, if they're asking it related to the position, they w- shouldn't be interviewing you if they thought you were weak related to the position. I'm not kidding. Like, I wouldn't say I have a weakness as much as I would say certain things I'm highly proficient at because of the level of expertise, the amount of time I've spent, and the number of scenarios or situations I've seen. And I would give them the array. And if you want to say on a relative on a relative comparison, this would be the thing I have the least amount of experience with. However, if faced with anything in that section, I would. Okay, remember something. Everything's relative. I know way more about leadership than I do about job searching. Everything that I know about job searching, even my weakest areas, I would say are stronger than 99, if not 100% of other career coaches' strengths. Right, like this is not, we don't all play on a, a, a level playing field. Asking about a technical weakness to you, your weakest point could be somebody's greatest strength. Well, you gotta remember this. So you have to have that context when you're gonna respond to that in an interview. So you don't wanna say, I'm weak in, because they put you all in the same box. Right, just because somebody talks about resume writing all, every video, everything, does not make them a better resume writer than I am where I talk about 50 different topics, right, kind of thing. Same thing for you. Just because somebody says, this is my bread and butter, doesn't make them better than your weakest asset or, or weakest experience. Just keep that in mind. That's a great question, though. Buffer monster. <laughs> you guys. Oh, wait, you guys liking this? If you, if you like it, click the, click, the, click the like button. Make sure you subscribe. Do you have any advice for preparing for analytical type questions for highly technical field? Yes, I do not prep. I make sure that I have the concepts down. I don't prepare for specific questions. I prepare for con- concepts. So you have core outlines, concepts, structures, protocols, methods. So you said to me, Andy, how would you run that particular project, IT project, I would say, just like I run all of them, right? You get the stakeholders in order, you figure out what the business problems are, you design the thing, you architect the thing, you build the thing, you test the unit, test it, you QA test it, you convert it, you do this, you do that. How would you build out the sales team? First thing I would do is I would do a customer segmentation to figure out where the market opportunities are, this, that, and the other thing. Then I would start staffing it up this way based on this and that. And the other. Boom, 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 boom. Makes no difference what the problem is. You have standard packs that, 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 that you have that you're going to use as a template anytime you get a technical question related to this. And then you think out loud and you show them your work kind of thing. That's how I prepare. So I prepare my outlines. Uh, Oh, well, that's an interesting name. Let's just call you JJ. Yes, I would also like to know how to prepare for a business analyst role as I am transitioning into the career and answer technical and analyst questions. Business analyst. So technical people trying to become business people is awesome. Okay. So when you are a technologist, all right, Andy Time Machine, we're going back. Okay, anytime machine, we're going back. All you technologists, so, so I, JJ, I know we can't rewind the clock here, but this is how I would think, and this is how you'll reverse engineer what you need to know. All of you technologists that have aspirations of having higher level roles at some point in your life, I don't care what your aspiration is, you don't even need to know what it is right now. Why am I doing it that way? What's the business problem I'm trying to solve? What's the most important requirement? Why does it need to be done that way? Right? When I told you the tool I I built, right? What was the business needs? Why did I have to build it that way? I had to automate this this way to solve this problem. So then I had to use these technologies, these macros, this, that, and the other thing, right? So when you are developing something as a technologist, you need to know from a business standpoint how it works. That's going to give you kick-started. 
then you're gonna need to learn what the specific business processes are that your technologies are handling. And that's how you make the transition by growing those business skills. Always understand, why is that important? Why do you need to do that that way? So when somebody says to you, JJ, can you build me a something that does this? Sure. How does that fit in the overall daisy chain of what you're doing? Where does that go? What happens next? What happened just prior? Right, all that stuff needs to be learned, right? You could pick that up on the job as you go. Geraldine, yes, you are, you are just all around awesome. When contacting the CEO through the boss hunting technique, how to avoid being sent to HR, I need to learn about the opportunities and pain points. So there's nothing wrong with being sent to HR after you contact the CEO. At least they're sending you to the HR person. And, and then I would, so I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be about avoiding it. I would be embracing it. So um, maybe, that's, maybe that's another way to, to say it. So I want you to avoid the ATS, right? So I want you to, so as, as an example, I want you to avoid the ATS because it's a bad medium and the odds are low. That's avoiding. Once you make human contact, I want you to embrace whoever they send you to because here's the way I think. CEO, awesome, thank you so much. I will get to the uh, HR person and connect with her or him or them or wh whoever. In the meantime, uh, as I reach out to them, I'd love to know, you know what your biggest challenges are. I'll certainly connect with the HR person, but I'd love to know if you know, your challenges and our needs are in alignment with something I feel I could help with. You know, Based on my research of what I've done already, I would assume that you need help with, or generally companies like yours need help with, is that, is that same for you? Is that true? Or so you can continue a dialogue, there's no... But I'm now about, now I'm onto the HR person. Now I'm like, how do I find out who that person is, what they're about, obsess over them, and make friends with them? You make friends with the HR person, was the HR per What do I need, what can I make of this? I can make friends with the HR person. The HR person could fall in love with me. The HR person could go, get the pom-poms, go into the CEO's office and start cheering about Geraldine. Right, like that's how I think. What can I make of this and what's the best outcome? The best outcome is that I make friends with the HR person. If the CEO gets back and, or doesn't get back, okay, that's fine. I can't do anything with that. But what can I do with the CEO? I can respond and ask a question, see if they would engage in the dialogue. If not, that's fine, right, kind of thing. It's not, in that case, it's not about avoiding. It's about embracing. Karen, Karen fought. Fauci? 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 I don't know. What will be the best approach from a professional applying from abroad that requires work permit but not a labor market impact assessment? Okay, so I'm not, I'm not entirely familiar with the LMIAs, but if you're applying ab abroad and you need a work permit, and I don't, know what, I don't know what country you are in and which one you're going to, but like if you're coming to the U.S., you got to have a hard skill that is in high demand or you have to have a skill that while maybe a little more commoditized, they're in such great demand, meaning a hard to find skill or something that is in great demand. Um, but here again, I'm also, uh, I'm also about understanding and having context around the need to move, meaning it's like, hey, Andy, I'm married or I have a partner and he or she's moving and I'm, I got to go, right? We're get we're a unit, family unit. So I gotta go, boom, we're getting transferred. So now I gotta find work. That's one thing. Or Andy, hey, I'm a single person and I live in Germany and I'd like to move to the US. I'd say find a German or an international company that has a US presence, get a job in Germany and get them to transfer you kind of thing. So I, I'm, I'm looking at, I, I need to look at everything because if you're just applying from abroad, that's hard. That's hard, you're gonna get eliminated pretty fast unless it's a pretty special skill. So that's, those are the routes. Ann Hawkins Badge, thanks Andy for this office hour, great to you, you're welcome my dear, hope to see you tomorrow. Nancy Lee, this could not have come at a better time, I was feeling lost. Nancy, we got, we got your back, we got your back, we got your back. 
GM, how does one answer the five-year question if no growth is available at the employer except the future manager's position? GM, just go watch my five-year video. It is perfectly packaged for you. EGR NHL, is it professional to ask the recruiter if they reached out to me for salary, job description, benefits, and the company employer? I am concerned if I do not ask, it will not be worth my time to ask a recruiter if they reached out to me for, I'm not entirely sure what you're asking me. If you're asking about a third party recruiter reaching out to you, before you do anything, you should understand who the company is. The salary to me is irrelevant. You go, right, kind of thing. If it's a corporate recruiter that reached out to you, I, I, I would investigate. Do you wanna work for the organization? Do you wanna work in, is there a possibility in the function they, that they're discussing with you and if not, are there possibilities with the, again, what can I make out of this? I might not want that position, but if, if I can crush that position, just get in, get them to fall in love with you and then poke around in the other areas. Chess, it's chess, not checkers. Doug Milligan, what's up? How long should the tell me about yourself answer be? I feel like I spend too much time on it. Um, let me say it this way, not to evade your question. I could tell you about me in like a minute, literally, or three, or 15. And I think that it's, it's appropriate to intercept yourself along the way to ask them if they want more detail. So if I'm going in, you could do a couple things. Now, an older video that I have out there that's very popular is the Tell Me About Yourself one. And in that video, I mentioned, because I'm speaking to everybody, because those of you that have individual coaching sessions with me know that the tell me about yourself question that I talk to you about with you particularly is wholly different than what's out on YouTube for me. So um, what, I would, what I would do is I would have a more career profile type dialogue down to then the companies. And what I would be doing is I would probably be cherry picking what I spent a lot of time on. Like we call it skimming and anchoring. You anchor on certain points that you know are necessary for them to know that tell them you're a good fit for the role. But I, I also like to intercept myself and say, you know, I, I can keep you know going deeper if you'd like. Are there any particular areas about my background you want me to, to cover kind of thing? But if you're talking for three minutes straight, that's a pretty long time to not be interrupted. It is. I know what three minutes looks like. Why do I, how do I know that so well? Because most of the answers that I give you are three minutes in, in these Q and A's. So, so I hope, I hope that helps. I don't, I'm, I, I, it isn't about, let me, one more thing for you, Doug. It isn't about how long the answer is. It's about how potent the answer is. You know what I mean? That, that, some people, they start and then they just start talking and then they're like going backwards or they're going forwards. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't need all 30 years. I don't need all 20 years. I don't need all five years, right, kind of thing. Give me the summary. So I, if, if somebody asks me no instruction to tell me about, I would talk about me in general, as in I'm a 33-year professional. I've worked in you know, these kind of capacities. I currently run an online training and coaching program, a recruitment firm, or whatever. Like, I, I peel the onion, that kind of stuff. I right, hope that helps. All right, how are we doing on the questions? Kara, Kara ran out in the Slack. Do you guys have any questions about my boot camp? It's $100 off. I'm, I got my stuff ready for all contingencies, although I didn't go into sales mode today. But you guys know it's, it's, um, it's coming up. We got, a, we got a little deadline tomorrow. I'm changing some format. My VIP program's going away. We're gonna get a mastermind for job search. We got all kinds of stuff going on. Let me see. Hi, Patty, Suzanne, Vanessa, Brandon Leo, what's up? TD Washington, what's new? Nicole Byron, how do you? Love the red, love the red shirt. Deb, always nice to see you. John Whitworth, hey. Aaron W, you are a leader. Ashley Green, what's up, Kurt? Hey, here we go. Hi, Ann. Hi, understood we should never reveal a desired salary to companies. How about external headhunters recruiters? Shall we provide them with a very minimum below which we should not even be considered? I love this. Hold on, let's get this one up here. Hold on. 
and just give me one second and and then was it Kara did you did you put it in just like she did with a space oh, dang let me see I don't know if I could get it super quick all oh, comments dang no can't 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 find it um all right so this is a great question uh so couple things I'm going to give you a little more than you asked for here because this this came up actually yesterday in one of my coaching sessions. It's okay to give an external recruiter your comp. You might be thinking, oh, the external recruiter needs to have some semblance of order of whether their client can handle you financially. All right? Now, it's a little different going with a third party. Now, what I would do is I would say, look, what... And what are you used to making? Ballpark it for me. You want to give me the exact? That's fine. And it, I make 300 grand. Awesome. If I know that my client wants to pay 280, and they said 250 to 280, I'd say, and no problem. We're going. We're going in. <laughs> right? We're going in. Because I know my client will stretch it because Ann's a badass. Okay? Then what'll happen is we're going to get down to the end because Ann's a badass. Ann's going to get an offer. My client's going to come to me and they're going to say, Andy, what's Ann want? I'm going to say 350 or whatever. Right? We're going to, we're going to, you and I are going to talk. And I'm going to say, Ann, give me your floor. This is a good recruiter. Not just anybody will do this. Give me your floor. Like, Andy, if they don't hit 310, tell them don't even bother putting the paperwork together. No problem. I want 380. Okay. What's your what's your kind of your cut line? 350? Okay, fine. I would go back to my client and I would say 380. Andy, we can't do that. Why not? Well, I mean then, then, this, then this goes on. Right? Why not? Well, you know, we really only wanted to spend 280. Now I'm going. Well, you know what? She's coming with this, that, and the other thing. You didn't think you were going to get that. Did you actually think you were going to get somebody? All 10 things. She's got all 10 things, this and that, right? I mean, like, now I'm now I'm going back and forth. And that's what's happening. Knowing where your where your thresholds are. Because now I know how, to, how pushy to be. And then my client finally says, Annie, what do you think will happen if we give her 350? And then I'd say, I don't know. Let me go ask her. Then I would come back to you and I would say, here's what we did, and here's what I did, and here's what I told her, and here's what she said. What do you think? I mean, like, that's how it goes. That's how it should go. So it's okay. And I'm going to tack one thing on. I'm helping somebody recruit an offer right now. He, uh, he went through the process, and they're going to come back with a number, and I think he makes, like, 280. Okay. So they're going to come back with a number. They're going to have some base and then they're going to have a bunch of stock. And if the number comes in where the base is like, say, 185 and the stock is worth, let's say, 60, 100, whatever. At this point, he makes his argument. Okay. He hasn't told the company what he's earned, what he's earning. They don't know. But if they go back and forth and all of a sudden they get down to the end and the company says, that's as high as we can go, 260. That's when he says, okay, I appreciate that. But just so you know, I mean, I currently earn 280. I'm not going to leave for less. And then you expose. Because this is, the, this is the last minute trick you throw in because at this stage in the salary negotiation, it's emotional. It's not logical anymore. You're tied as a team. They want you. I said to him before we went through his scripts of negotiation, how long have they been looking? Four months. This is a new team? It is. How badly do they need somebody like you? Badly. Have they, have they tried to hire anybody else? I don't know. Right? Like all that. Okay. Now, 20K more, 50K more. Do you know how penal it is to lose you at this point when I've been looking for 16 weeks or six months and then I got to go cold and start this up again? 
you could be 50K to the good by the time they find somebody kind of thing. So, so people say, well, should you ever reveal your salary? Andy, what should I put on my, my resume? Whatever markets you best. Well, should I reveal your salary? Only if, it, only if it's a counter tactic that you need to pull out because it's going to get you more money. What, what don't you do? Tell them up front. Right? You only pull this stuff out at the end when you need to. This is like last minute stuff because now it's emotional. I've told you the story about my, my family room and the painting, right? We, had, we moved in this house in 2017. We had every room painted. There's not a chip in the paint in any room. My wife doesn't like the color of the living room paint. She wants to get it repainted. I said, honey, why? I value it at zero. We get quotes, 4,000, 3,000. I'm like, you, this is nuts. I don't want to pay four grand for a room to get painted. Finally, we got my painter to do it for two grand. Of course, what happened? I gave in. Why? I love my wife. Why? We're a team. Why? Her feelings matter to me. The, I don't value the room two grand, but I now value your feelings at 280, right? Kind of thing. Because I need you. We're, we have a relationship. I need to care about what you care about even though I don't actually care about it. I don't care what color the paint is in my family room, right? Kind of thing. This is, I know it's silly, but this is negotiation at the 11th hour. I know you didn't ask for that, Ann, but like this is a big one because like people think, oh, why? I would tell them that matters. Like that's context that gives them perspective. What's going through your mind? It doesn't matter to them, but you, what go, is going through your mind should matter to them at that stage, not in the beginning. Dennis C., as a developer, what do you think about having a PDF file displaying key information about projects, one per page, with a link to more detailed PDF chat opinions? I think not. I think not. I think if you're getting into an interviewing process and they want to get a better understanding of some of your projects, then, then that's okay. Diamond. Hi, Andrew. I have a second interview panel. Awesome. Coming up one week after I reached out to the hiring manager, what questions do, you, do I anticipate? I have no idea. I honestly don't. I, they're all different. They're all different. Buffer Monster, how does one make the answer to the question, why do you want to work here? Check my video. Why do you want to work here? Music 80s, what does one do if asked multiple times about salary questions and the interviewer will not leave the question without an answer? You say, do you have a budget in mind? Tell me what that is and I'll tell you if I'm okay with it. They'll tell you what it is in 90% of the cases. You just say, I'm okay with that and keep going. Shalin Nagori, what is the best way to find bosses except LinkedIn? The very best way to find bosses is in my job search coaching program where we teach you how to use Google Boolean to do that. But on LinkedIn, that's a that LinkedIn is is probably the best way if you aren't using something that we're teaching you to do. Fix it. Oh wait, hang on. Oh, hang on. A bunch more came in. How are we doing on time? I got some time for you guys here today. Sue, Andy, every time I attend your session, I think you will not be able to top it, and I'm wrong every time. Yes, fantastic talk today. Thank you for the from the bottom of my heart. Sue, I appreciate you. You know this, right? All you guys. We've talked about check and tape, right? So, you guys have no idea what I'm talking about. Every single show, every single show, I watch right after, so I take it in. I watch it as if I'm you, not knowing what I know. Did I say it the right way? Did I give them the right analogies? Could I have been faster? Should I have been, should I have been slower? Should I give them more examples? Did I make sure I caught everything that was going through their head that could have been construed as a conflict or whatever? Then I watch it again as me, right, kind of thing. Then I watch it again looking for just incremental improvements or different ideas. Every week when we show up, you guys ask me similar questions, right, over and over. And I realized not everybody knew I had those videos out there or saw them, and that's cool. That's fine. But I'm always thinking about, is there a better, faster way I could say it? Is there a different way I can say it? Is there, you know, the person who might come to three shows in a row heard the same question get asked each week. Did I, did I, you know, did I improve it each time? And you're looking to get this much better each time. The talk today only took me 
10 minutes to write, right? I ran through just the story about my estimating model once. Um, there were a couple expressions I definitely had to get in about stripping it down to the studs and the less is more. Those are the only two things I needed to remember to tell you, right? And then there's just the points, right? Kind of thing. So you're constantly looking at how can I make it more fun? How can I make it better? How can I tell better stories? How can I use better analogies? Like all that stuff is like, if you guys think I just show up on a Thursday and then turn the camera on, you don't see the invisible work that goes into this. You need to do this for you. You need to do this for you. It takes effort, hard work. But I appreciate I appreciate that, Sue. I really do. Nash Rucker, boot camper interview with a director VP tomorrow. Any questions I should anticipate? Again, it's hard for me to know what they're going to ask you. I don't know what the position is, who the company is, what you've been through, what questions they've already asked, what the job description looks like. So I wish you luck, though, Nash. Fix it, Fox. What do you, what do you think about an engineer quitting full time job to do YouTube meets all my criteria? Okay, I need to take a drink for this one. <laughs> Fix it, Fox. I wish I could sit down with you for about two hours and do nothing but talk you out of that. And you might say, well, Andy, you know, you're you're living your dream, right? You're helping people and this and that. <clears throat> That's true. But what you didn't see is how hard this is. And I care so much about you people that I would try to talk every single one of you out of doing what I do because it is the most brutal thing you could ever imagine. And no matter how brutal you think it is, you ain't even scratching the surface of the kind of pain and suffering you're going to go through if you want to do what I do. And I'm not being melodramatic. I'm telling you it ain't for the faith of heart. And every day, my LinkedIn feed is filled with blood of people who tried to do this, who reached out to me, said, I'm making it a go, only for me to find them taking new jobs in six months or a year. It's rough. It's really rough. Okay? And you have to have every skill in the book. That whole hire a team stuff is nonsense. You need to be able to teach. You need to be able to market sell, build products that people will buy, keep them engaged. There's every imaginable business function that you need to know how to do in order to do this successfully. And it will take you so much longer than you could ever imagine. That unless you are footloose, fancy free, have no debt, no anybody at home to take care of, and I'm even including the dog, okay? Like, unless you are so certain, I wouldn't do it. I really wouldn't. I would try to talk you out of it. I really would. And if I t showed you and let you look under the covers, you 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 would you would be surprised. So that's that's what I think. But on the other side of my mouth, I want you to follow your passion. Are you are fix it fox? I don't know if you're in my boot camp, but if you are in my boot camp, my job search boot camp, and up front I teach you how to test your why and your, your desire to do something and to know if it's a burning desire or a passing fancy. And if you can get past that and you can convince yourself that you're gonna, you, you will take the lumps and you won't quit and, I'm, and, and you gotta sketch all that out because you are gonna encounter stuff that you cannot even imagine. Not to mention, you get, your skin's gotta be super thick. You guys don't see a lot of what I see, right? So, and the bigger you get, the more people you help, the more uh, the more diverse the crowd gets, the more difficult it gets. So, all right, I hope that helps in some way. Know me, know me. Hey, Andy, going great. How a person can select one industry out of two like FMCG? Um, you, FM, I mean, I'm not sure. I, you strung those together. I've never seen that. Consumer goods? or F financial something or another, and education. So I'm not sure what those are. Pick the one you want the most. Juliana H., hey Andy, how do you handle the negotiation phase? If I got the interview through boss hunting, networking with no specific role advertised, and they're not desperate to fill a position. You don't worry about the negotiation phase until you harness, wait, Juliana H., 
Are you Juliana H. in my boot camp? If you are Juliana H. in my boot camp, the exact answer, the full-fledged show and tell, grid everything for you for what you just asked is in the is in my job search coaching program it is the negotiation session with advanced tactics that's what you need and so i think i think that you are in my i think that you are in my program if you are not in my program if you are not in my program what you need to do is not number 1 not worry about the negotiation phase you have nothing to negotiate you don't even have a a job description and once the job description is is packaged and if you say well Andy they want to hire me but there is no job description nah, eh. no you never take a job without a clear scope of responsibilities I, you don't have to call it a job description you could be a one page sheet of paper I don't care if you write it on a bag or whatever right like anything is fine but you have to be clear and so what I teach you to do is how to break down so this is in the this is in the boot camp I teach you how to break down the, the different areas and how to cite the benefits and the goals and all this other stuff so that you have a focal point to get them focused on the value you're going to contribute. We even have a sample from one of the coaching sessions of one of the guys that was in the, in the program. We just kind of give you an idea as well. I think that's you. If not, then, then, then you just wait down to the end. You get some concrete information around what you're going to do and the value you're going to have and you negotiate around that and thanks for your answer on salary you're welcome give my minimum to a recruiter who said sorry above budget you okay di didn't i miss the opportunity to inch myself okay so and it isn't about minimums so it, okay if a recruiter calls me i'm gonna say i'm open i earn 300k I'm open. It's not just about the money. You got a job for 250, I want to talk to you about it. Right? Just it's okay to do that. Because you got to get them to fall in love. It, a recruiter who tells you you're over budget without even like really sniffing it out, then there's an absolute certainty that that recruiter knows that his client, her client, whatever it is, won't go above it. So you might have saved some time there. But if you just said, "Hey, I'm flexible," You probably, you want to have dialogue about you with that person so that if there are other opportunities, that person will think of you. Fast moving consumer goods. Oh, um, what could be the points for selecting an industry out of two? I see. Perfect. Okay. Um, Nomi, I don't think you're in my job search coaching program. In in the, in the, if for all those that are in the program, you have a you have a, a spreadsheet that I give you that highlights your criteria. So what's most important to you? So you're like in for you in the free zone is the happiness factors. Okay, and you want to make a list of your criteria, and then what you want to do is based on your criteria, you want to rank your criteria. What's most important? This is a ten. It's a must have. This is a eight. It's a pretty close to must have this is a five kind of middle of the road one ah, it's total gravy right and then what you do is uh, I teach you how when you evaluate companies to match each company against the benchmarks that you set and you rate them in how closely they match your criteria as a career changer or somebody picking an industry you would have industry lines or you would have uh, career lines but the the model and the principles apply for choosing anything. The most important thing in choice is you don't make a relative choice, meaning you don't, you don't compare uh, FMCG to education. You don't do that. That gives you poor results. This is called moral algebra and it sucks. You create a standard benchmark against which all your options are measured. Right. If you're at a current, if you have a current employer, you want to benchmark them. They score this well. You have a new option. Oh, they didn't even score as well as my current employer. Why would why would you leave? Kind of thing. Right. It's a standard set. It's not this or that. It's this against me and it's that against me. So for you, you would line up the consumer goods and the education against your criteria and which one of those is so like edu like let me just take this for example do you care more about giving me a consumer good andy guy by needs to buy a t-shirt or 
do you care more about educating Andy or kids or whatever your education is? Like some of these things are totally different, right? And I don't know all what your criteria is or whatever, but like I'd be thinking in terms of what brings me more joy. That, I mean, between those options, sounds like it, it would probably be a fairly easy thing if you listed out your criteria. And if you're, if for everybody, anybody who's in my job search coaching program, we have the tools already for you to do this. They're already pre-built. Uh, Zakia, Ra, are there strategies for targeting contract roles, but still using your bootcamp? It's the same with contract roles. It's the same. You can target companies. You can t- target taf- staffing firms. This is different than recru- third-party recruitment firms. A third-party outsourcing or contracting firm is a good thing for you to do if you're a contractor. If you're an executive, I don't want you to call an executive search firms kind of thing. But the boot camp principles, we have loads of contractors in there, self-employed people who use it. It's, it's the same. It's very similar tactics. There's a few little twists. Damon Diaz, rejected from a company as a top three candidate. The recruiter called me after the rejection and asked that I reapply in the coming months. What's the best way of approaching this? When you are rejected, uh, number one, make sure you watch my how to get the job after being rejected video. That's the first thing. And then you send that email so that you can tee yourself up to call them in 30 days and in three months. The second thing specific to what you asked me is... If they say, can you reapply, you go back to the recruiter and don't reapply. You say, hey, I'm reaching back to you. I know we talked about, um, we talked about, you know, reaching back to you. I wanted to reach back to see if anything has changed. I want you to know I'm still greatly interested in your company, this and the other thing. Once, let's, let's, Damien, let's bring this up. Any of you that have made a connection with a company and you've gone through an interview process, You have contacts at that company. You do not ever go through the applicant tracking system ever again. You always go back to the recruiter or you always go back to the contacts or you always go back to people who interviewed you or boss or whatever. You don't go through the ATS and say, because you could say, I would say, hey, I noticed there's another position similar, another system engineering position in such and such a division. Hey, recruiter, is that yours? If it is, I'd love to be considered. Would you... Do you think that's a good fit for me? Hey, recruiter, if that's not yours, do you know the recruiter responsible for that? Can you get me over to that person? Or you go to the boss. Hey, I know. Hey, I really connected with you and your team. I hope your whoever you hired is working out working out great. This and that and the other thing, right? Blah blah blah. I noticed there's a position. Might you know the hiring official over there? I'd love to reach out directly to them or the recruiter or whatever. You you're you're never going in the applicant track system again. You shouldn't, right? Like just once you've made that connection. All right, guys, 1227, I got to get my my announcements in. Job search coaching program. That's my boot camp. That's tomorrow, 11 o'clock. Monday, 1 o'clock. Hey, you know what, Uh, Kara, I know this is kind of last minute. Can you throw the daily planning tool in? Just throw it in really quick. Or Stacy. I have a, it's just, it's, it just warms my heart all over on Monday. So tomorrow, job search. Monday, productivity. Productivity challenge, session number two. You can get in, try out me out for a month at 49 bucks if you want. Check out the leadership program. And we're talking about how to plan your weeks and days. And I have a daily planning tool that I think I'm, I'm going to offer up in my two, Tuesday digest or whatever. But maybe if the team is dancing, they can dump the, um, they can dump the link in. In there, it's a freebie, and it's a one-page sheet with three columns of how I run my day, and it's a it's a sweet little it's a sweet little little gift that you guys can take to get more familiar with how I look at productivity. But we're on all month, every Monday, one o'clock, and Monday is a CDT. Kara, we need to change the emails to CDT because we're daylight time uh, starting this weekend in the US. So all my, my friends in Singapore and in, in, in Germany that I, I coach and in, in England and all you guys or whoever whoever's not changing their clocks, we need to make sure that our coaching sessions are on the right time. Um, there's the tool. You know, you can leave your chat open and grab it. It's really, really cool. It'll give you a peek into I got I think I got a lesson for you on Sunday 
about how I plan my day and what I do. That goes to, that'll go to everybody, whether you're in my leadership program or whether you're uh, just in the, a general member of my community or not in that program. And then on Monday at, at one o'clock, we've got the live session. And if you can't make it, we, we give you the replays. It's a really, really fun program. So I hope to see you guys. I loved this session. I'm glad we got a full 90 in today. Make sure to share this. A lot of people need help. Uh, if you like it, click the thumbs up button. Make, sure, button. make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And I'll see my boot campers tomorrow. I'll see my leaders on Monday. I'll see everybody in the inbox over the next couple of days. All right, you guys be good. Love you all. Thanks for your attention. I really, I can't thank you enough. I really, you guys thrill me. You really do.